My name is Gita Klitgaard, and most people call me Gita Klitgaard, except the Dutch sometimes call me Gitte, which it's totally not, but it's kind of cute. Um, so I'm here to talk about the imposter syndrome, and first I will show you the obligatory slide. Yes, we have this app, and you can also ask questions, and then the questions will go into the track host, and he can read them out. Uh, and if you don't do this, we can also have questions afterwards, or if you don't feel comfortable speaking in here, I will also be available afterwards. So sometimes I have these slides about me, sometimes I don't, and whether I have them or not, people say they need the other ones. Um, so I'm native wired on Twitter. Uh, if you've been following the Twitter stream from Go to Amsterdam, you may have noticed that I tweet a little bit. So beware if you follow me, I do tweet a lot. Um, I'm an agile coach, and basically what we do is we go around and we hug trees. Um, that's what I do for a living. Um, I used to be, well, I used to be, a uh, programmer and a tester, I found out that what I'm really, really good at is actually working with people. Uh, what I'm really, really even better at is working with geeks, because I get them. Uh, so I started becoming an agile coach. Oh, it doesn't show very well, but I'm actually, I'm actually hawking a real tree in Barcelona on this picture. Um, so I do this, I go out into organizations, I prefer working with the teams. Uh, because that's the one I relate to most, but I also do work with managers. I do introduce all kinds of processes. Um, I have taken the oath of non-allegiance. I do not say that any process is wrong, at least until I tried it in that situation. Uh, I think that uh, all processes are wrong, some are good, just like models. Uh, we can use them in some situations. So I'm a pragmatic, agile coach. I am also a speaker. Uh, I sometimes co-speak. This is from a talk about uh, having the courage, or workshop about having the courage to be yourself. So I kind of have two topics. One is uh, the more agile ones. I talk about retrospectives. I talk about why the why is important, why change is hard. And then I have the other part, which is uh, I talk about the things that very few people talk about. So I talk about having the courage to be yourself. I talk about stress and depression and why it kills us. Um, and I talk about the imposter syndrome. So this is a fairly new one. Uh, I wasn't sure if anyone would like it, but like one hour after I did it the first time, I was hired to do it in two more places. So apparently this is something that relates to a lot of people. I also offer free hugs. Uh, this is from a big conference in Germany. I was talking to this guy and a woman comes up to me, she just hugs me and then she goes away again. Um, so this is interesting. Uh, I do this because I think we pay way too little attention to each other. We don't see each other, we just walk past each other. When I give a hug, I give my full attention to that one person. So it doesn't have to be a physical hug, because a lot of people don't like hugging. It can also just be giving my attention to that one person. And I think this is something we lack a lot in our work life and in our daily life. Uh, so this is why I offer this. Um, I'm also a little bit crazy, so I do have a Be Brave tattoo, which is because you have to have the courage to be yourself. I was almost 40 before I found out that it's okay to be a geek. It's okay to be a grown-up and like Star Wars. And I just got my new Jedi robe, so I have to wear it in this one. Um, and yes, it's from jedirobes.com, you can buy. This is Luke's, of course. Uh, and I'm an ant. I'm very much an ant. I like to teach the kids that you can be anything you want. You can still play as a grown-up. Uh, until my nephew was seven, he thought my job was to be a pirate. Uh, and he was so disappointed when he found out I was not. And because I'm a girl, he thinks I'm one of the good pirates because only men can be evil pirates. I haven't told him about Bloody Mary yet, um, but he will. So for today, I'm going to talk about the gist of the imposter syndrome. Uh, I am going to talk about why I am actually talking about this. And then I'm going to go a bit more into what it is um, and what's actually good about the imposter syndrome. So we tend to take all of these things uh, that are different. Depression, uh, neurodiversity, Asperger's, imposter syndrome, and see them as something bad. But in each one of these, there is something good. For instance, with depression, it turns out that depressive people are the best at estimating. They give the most realistic estimates. You would think that they would give the most negative estimates, but it actually turns out that depressive people have a much better view of reality than other people. 
So the gist of this is basically this. I don't know, it's not really a good picture, but this is a cat in the middle with two huskies. So that is basically what the imposter syndrome is. At some point, point somebody's going to find out I'm actually not a husky. So this is Rosie. She was raised by these two huskies, and she actually does believe she is a husky. And this was just a picture that um, her owners put up. So, so this cat will not believe you if you tell her she's not a husky, except that she doesn't speak human language either. So basically, um, this is from the coach, coach book. Everyone else is better than me. I'm not as good as people think, and one day somebody's going to find out. This is something that a lot of people suffer from, especially intelligent people. What I do is actually not really that good. I was just lucky to be here. At some point, somebody's going to come up to me and figure out, shit, I'm actually not a Jedi. This is actually not really Luke's rope, it's just a copy. And this, I'm sorry, it's not a lightsaber. It's inflatable, which makes it very nice to travel with, but it's not a real lightsaber. And that is actually how you feel. The thing is that the people who feel like this, most of them will actually be a Jedi. They just feel like, this is how I am. I'm just plastic and something I bought in a shop. I'm actually not a really good dev developer. I was just in the right place at the right time. I just happened to do this. Um, a friend of mine told me that her, her PhD counselor, who was a professor for more than 40 years, said he feels like at some point somebody's going to come up to me, he's going to tap me on the shoulder and saying, <coughs> I'm sorry, sir, that's been a mistake. You should never have been a professor for that long. You don't know what you're doing. So this is something that's very common in a lot of us, and yet we don't speak about it. So why am I talking about it? Um, my kind of agile coaching is very much by intuition. I listen to people, and I suggest what I think they should do. Of course, a lot of it is based on me studying computer science, me actually being in a development team, me being in a lot of organization. But most of what I do is based on my intuition. And I know a lot of agile coaches who knows all about systems theory and complexity theory and psychological theories and everything. And I keep thinking, I'm actually not an agile coach. Actually, I don't know enough about this. I don't know enough about queuing theory. I haven't read the goal yet. I'm supposed to be reading Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, and at some point, somebody's going to come up to me and say, hey, you know what? You're not a real agile coach. You just do things by intuition. You don't know what you're doing. Um, this is because in 2011, I met the, the Agile tribe in Germany. And the first, for the first time in my life, I found out that, yes, there are people like me. There are people who want to make the world better. There are people who think dragons are cool, also grown-ups, and who think pirates are cool and Star Wars is cool, and that is okay. It changed my life from being gray and hiding in the corner to now entering in a room and as you may notice, I'm not really gray and hiding anymore. Uh, though my robe does hide me a little bit. Um, so, I started wearing colors and stuff. And I'm kind of like, I was so lucky I was there. But actually, I was not. Actually, the reason I was there was because I was a crew at uh, GoTo, even before, long before it was called GoTo, in the good old days. I started as a student crew, ended up being there for 15 years. Um, so my last time as a crew was in 2014. I would have students staying at my place, student crew, because, I mean, I was not home anyway. I had an air mattress and some, some duvets. They could stay at my house. And this one guy stayed at my house, and we talked. And he heard about this agile coach camp. And he thought it would be something for me. So actually, I was not lucky to be there. I was there because I shared my home with a stranger. Um, I was sharing, which is part of what a lot of Agile is, we share, we help each other. And that's why I ended up there. But still, I kind of have this feeling, I'm actually just lucky. Um, what happens when people find out I'm actually not a speaker? I mean, I've only been speaking for three years. Um, and I did 25 talks, and at some point, somebody's going to find out I'm actually not a speaker, I'm just me. And I do have this feeling. Uh, I know it might sound a bit pretentious, but that's actually how I feel. And the reason I started doing this talk was because I was invited to speak at uh, London Lean Kanban Days. 
So Jose comes up to me and says, hi, I'm Jose, I would like you to speak at my conference. I'm like, okay, hi, I'm Gita, who are you? And he tells me about his conference, and I say, okay, so what do you want me to talk about? I don't care, I hear you're a good speaker. So a guy I never met before comes up to me and tells me this, and I'm kind of like, fuck. <laughs> and I've been wanting to look more into the imposter syndrome, uh, so I decided I'm gonna do a talk about it, because I'm not the only one who feels this way. There must be a lot of other people who feel this way, uh, but we're terrified to speak about it. <coughs> so, if nobody else will speak about it, I will. Um, that's kind of what I do. So what is it? Um, some facts about it. It was described first time in 1978 by two psychologists who found out that there were a lot of high-achieving women who were talking themselves down. Um, there's still debate today, is this something that only happens to women? Uh, is it something that happens to, to men as well? I believe it happens to men as well, especially after my last talk, when a guy came up to me and said, I almost cried. I didn't think anyone else was feeling this way. Uh, so I don't care about what the, all the surveys say. Men suffer from this as well. Some surveys actually say that up to 70% of the Western population has been suffering from this at one point in their life. 70% have been feeling this way. So, the definition, it's about high-achieving individuals who has an inability to internalize their accomplishments and a persistent fear of being exposed posed as a fraud. So it's also called the fraud syndrome. The reason, um, well not the reason, what, what happens is that no matter how many times you get proof that you're really, really good. You get a pay rise. You get good ratings when you give a talk. You have people come up to you and thank you. You are not able to internalize this. You are not able to take it in and actually believe it yourself. And what you are thinking, what I am thinking sometimes is, at some point they're just gonna find out I'm not as smart as they think I am. I'm really, really good at pretending to be smart and pretending to be an agile coach and a speaker, and at some point, somebody's gonna find me out. Um, and what they found out during the survey was also, it's a, they went into high-achieving women. They have faith in their intelligence, and a lot of high-achieving women have no confidence. I see this very often, really, really high-achieving women who will say, no, I'm not really good enough. When I ask them, you should go speak at conferences, we want more female speakers, not because female speakers is a virtue in itself, but because we want to have a diversity. We want men, women, different colors, different, well, even all genders. There's non-binary, it's a spectrum. We want all kinds of people to be speaking because we are all kinds of people. And by having speakers of all kinds, we will be able to give a much better message. We will hear it from different parts because we all think differently. Um, but a lot of women lack this confidence. And what I also see is a lot of men lack this confidence. They're just really, really good at bullshitting most of them. Um, a lot of, actually, if you see people who are really, really confident, a lot of them are just really, really insecure inside. And they're even more afraid they're gonna be found out. Um, so the result was that actually these women had a lot of uh, well, diligence, it's a horrible word. What it actually means is they work a lot. What they do is because they think that somebody's gonna find out that I'm actually not really good. I'm not gonna be able to live up to my last results. They work and they work and they work and they do things really, really well, really, really thoroughly and a lot of them will be perfectionists. So this is one of the characteristics, uh, which often also uh, leads to a burnout. Because you try to be perfect, you try to do everything so nobody is gonna find out that you are actually not really good at what you do. So if I just work really, 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 really hard, nobody's gonna find out that I cheated them. And again, this feeling of being phony, this feeling of I'm not really how people perceive me, I'm not really good at this, I'm really not a good manager, I'm not a good developer, I'm not a good tester, whatever. It's just something people perceive. They often use charm. Um, I'm sorry you can't really see the pictures. I tried to put in as many cat pictures as possible. This is a cat imposing as a penguin. 
Uh, you'll get the slides afterwards. Um, so often they found out that these women used their charm to try to get more recognition and more acknowledgement. And often they would go to their superiors, whether it was a manager, a CEO, um, a professor, whatever, they would go to their managers and almost beg to be acknowledged, beg to get recognition. And when they got this, they would actually blame it on their charm. They would blame it on, I'm actually really likable. Um, and again, I've tried this myself. So the reason I'm here is because Catherine Kirk came up to me in London. So I know Catherine from other conferences. She came up to me and says, hey, do you want to do a talk and go to Berlin at my track? And part of me is kind of like, yes, this is really important. We need to talk about it. Another part is like, maybe it's just because Catherine likes me. Maybe it's just because I'm a nice person. Um, and what I also know with my logical brain is that nobody or at least very, very few, is going to put me on a stage at a big conference where people actually pay to come if I'm not a good speaker. I'm going to be in a panel also in Berlin. Nobody puts me on a panel with Linda Rising if I'm not a good speaker. That scares the shit out of me. Somebody's going to find out I'm not good enough before that happens. And still, I keep thinking it's because Catherine likes me. And that is also one of the symptoms of imposter syndrome. Um, there is often very little display of confidence, because if you show confidence, then people might pull you down. If you show that you're confident in something, people might actually go in and look at you and find out that you're not really good at this. So they avoid displaying confidence. And a lot of them suffer from burnout and sleep deprivation. Um, and I think we see this very much in our industry as well. We see a lot of people burning out, and some of it is caused by sleep deprivation. Because you can never, ever do all you want. I'm still struggling with this. I want to do so many things. I've started saying no to the things I don't want to do. But saying no to things that you want to do is horrible. There are so many places to go, so many books to read, so many people to meet, so many things to learn. And I want to do everything. And that's one of the reasons we burn out, is because we want to do all these things. And with people with imposter syndrome, what often happens is they feel like they have to. If I don't know all these things, I'm not good enough. I'm not going to be able to keep my job, my wife, my husband, whatever. I'm not good enough if I don't do all of these things. Because if I don't do all of these things, they're going to find out I'm a fake and throw me out. So this leads to burnout and sleep deprivation, which, uh, as you can see on one of my talks on the internet, the big internet, can lead to stress and depression. And um, some people start killing themselves and stuff. It's actually a big problem in DevOps at the moment is that young people are killing themselves. So in the US, they are talking about um, it being a phenomenon like they have in Japan, which is work-related suicide. This is a big, big problem. And imposter syndrome is one of the things that can lead to this. So this is from the Coach's Coach book, which is by Jeff Watts. Um, this is how people feel inside. If I can do it, it can't be very hard. Uh, I find this is often something that we have, is that if I can do it, it's not very difficult. Because it feels easy to me. But maybe it feels easy to me because I did this 10,000 times. Maybe it's easy to me because it's natural, because my brain is mathematical. Maybe that's why. When I was studying computer science, uh, I, was, I hadn't coded before computer science. And I was working, um, so the guy I wrote a master thesis with had been coding since, I think since he was born, at least he was that good at coding. And I kept looking at him and seeing, damn, I'm a really, really poor coder. But actually, I'm an okay coder. But what I'm really, really good at is making sure we get everything, that things are tested, that we actually deliver something that people want and that people need. Um, I'm really good at making requirements that are not, it has to be as easy as possible to use. Try implementing that. Um, and that is actually a real requirement from one of my first projects was the system has to be as easy as possible to use. 
which is quite difficult to test or verify or code. It has to be fast. Those are some of the things I'm really good at. And what I'm really good at is making a team gel, helping teams work together. Uh, and to me, I kind of feel like, well, I don't really do anything. I just listen to people a little bit and talk to them and figure out what they need, and that's basically all I do. It's not that hard. And that is kind of also one of the symptoms of the imposter syndrome. If I can do it, it can't be that hard. I was so lucky I was just there at that time. If I hadn't been at Dean London Kanban days when Catherine had come in, would I actually be here? Maybe, maybe not. Does that mean I'm not a good speaker? Well, you have to decide that afterwards, of course. Um, but people feel this way. I was just lucky to meet this guy. I was just lucky to be there. I was just lucky that the thing I knew something about happened to become popular. I don't understand why everyone thinks this much of me. I'm just me. I mean, I'm just a little Danish girl from nowhere in Denmark. Um, why do people think about this? And that is, again, one of the things. I still need to do X. Um, I still need to read this book to actually be good. I still need to program in this language. I still need to whatever. Things that happen in your head when you have the imposter syndrome. Maybe if I read these 10 books, I will be good enough. Maybe if I start coding in Ruby with one hand and C with the other, I'll be a good coder. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you are a good coder. Maybe you're a good coder because you can't program in more than one language at a time. Maybe being able to focus is actually a good ability as a coder. So these are some of the things that pop up into people's heads. And so many people have this at some point in their life, and it damages us a lot. So what's actually really good about this? So I'm going to take a step to the side and tell you about the Dunning-Kruger effect. So I don't know if you can read it, but it says, so I forgot what they're called in English. Calvin and Hobbes. I, I say it's a fallacy. The kid needs 12 years of schooling. Three months is plenty. Look at me. I'm smart. I don't need 11 and a half more years of school. It's a complete waste of my time. Hmm, how on earth did you get all the way to the bus stop with both feet, feet through one pants legs? Hmm, I fell down a lot. Why? What's your point? Nothing. I was just curious. This is the Dunning-Kruger effect. Some people who are not that smart think they really are. So basically, the Dunning-Kruger effect means, um, let's see if I can do this. If you are a novice, you'll be like, oh, I, there's this knowledge here from novice to expert, and there's the confidence. So basically, what happens is, of course, like, if you don't know anything, you probably know that you don't know anything. Then you know a tiny bit, and you're kind of like, I once was blind, and now I see. I know everything. I am an expert at this. This is the Dunning-Kruger effect. Then what happens is, whoa, there's more to this than I thought. You go down and say, hmm, I'm never, ever going to understand this. Um, hmm, it's starting to make sense. And then you go to, trust me, it's complicated. The more you know, the more you know that you don't know. Um, the more you know in an area, the more you will know that you will never, ever, ever be able to understand all of this area. You will know that the amount of information, the amount of things you can do is so vast, you will never, ever know. I used to think that Agile was about doing Scrum, about doing the processes. I totally loved Scrum in the beginning. I mean, I call myself semi-autistic because I like small boxes. Um, and and I, I could get those small boxes and still get my freedom. Then I found out, no, it's really about values. Whew, OK, I looked into values, found out what it do. It has nothing to do with that. It's really about people. And man, is that a big subject. People's brain, philosophy. We just heard a talk earlier today about philosophy, about psychology, about how our brain works, about how people interact. It's a big, 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 big field. So the more I know about Agile, the more I don't have any clue about Agile. Um, and that is one of the things that leads to the imposter syndrome, which also means that only intelligent people suffer from the imposter syndrome. So if you do have the imposter syndrome, if you do feel like a fraud, you're intelligent. You're actually really good at what you do. 
And all the ex exercises, yeah. All the research shows that only intelligent people suffer from the imposter syndrome. So if you do feel like fraud, remember this. Um, <laughs> so this is me and my friend Toby. Um, we actually both feel this way. I'm not really good enough for the imposter syndrome because the imposter syndrome is for smart people. So I'm actually not good enough to think I'm a fraud. So that's kind of like the double imposter syndrome. <laughs> um, and we both have this. Um, and I, like I said before, this is a workshop we do where we talk about exploring your own courage, uh, which is a three-hour workshop where we look into what is your courage, how can you be brave, and help these people understand that everyone is actually brave in their own way. And we help them take tiny steps for the next thing. And it's a really, really effective and efficient workshop. It's amazing what people get out of this just by creating a safe space. And we're kind of like, yeah, but we're not really doing anything creating a safe space. We're kind of just here and, and putting up some rules and stuff. Um, but now I've done it like six times, and every single time I get awesome feedback. And still, I feel like I'm not good enough for the imposter syndrome. Um, so how can we use this to our advantage? So Mark Kilby is a coach from Florida, and he did a blog post. So all the links to the cat pictures and stuff is in my slides, uh, so you can find them afterwards, and also to this blog post. So the first thing is that when we suffer, when we have this fear, what we need to understand is that this is because we are growing. This is because we are moving into new areas. This is because we are learning. So actually, it's good to feel this way. You have to realize that what you do is unique. Nobody in the whole world did what you did. Nobody lived your life. Which means that whatever you do, you bring in your own uniqueness. No matter what gender you have, education you have, what culture you come in from, you bring in something totally, totally unique. And even if you would take a person with the same age and gender, growing up in the same area, you would still be you. So no matter what, whatever you bring is unique. And this is something I had to read like 10 times before I did this talk on imposter syndrome because I'm kind of like, I am not a psychologist. I don't know very much except what you read in soda psychology magazines or on the internet. With, and ha half of it is probably a lie. But what I do have is I suffer from the imposter syndrome a lot of times. I'm getting better, I'm learning that, okay, maybe so many people will, would not lie to me. Um, but still, I suffer from it. And what I'm trying to realize is I'm unique. And what I can give to you is my story. I can explain it from my point of view. You need to recognize your accomplishments. And this is the really, really hard part. Because if you remember the definition, it was you are not able to internalize your accomplishments. But you need to go and you need to recognize your accomplishments. And one of the things you can do is write them down. Sit down every evening and look at what did I actually do today that made a difference. Write at least five things. And yes, no matter what you think right now, you did do five things today that made a difference for someone. Whether that someone is you or that someone is someone else, that doesn't matter. You did something today, you did an accomplishment today. When you do really big accomplishments, go in, write it down, make a blog post. You can also go tell someone, that also helps sometimes. But it's more important if you can acknowledge it by yourself. I have this little Chinese box, which is a wooden box that my grandfather bought in China. And every time I do something and people tell me something good, if it's physical on paper, I put it in. If it's online, I print it out and I put it in there. And when I have a really bad day, I take this out and reading from people, hey, that workshop you did on courage now made me submit to a conference. I pick out these things and I look at them. And that's one of the things you can do is 
start looking at what feedback you actually get and start giving yourself good feedback. And keep pushing your boundaries. If we don't push our boundaries, we are not going to get better. People think that if you stay in your comfort zone, it's just going to be the same size. It's not. To be able to learn, we need to step, step into what some people call the learning zone, some people call it the growing zone. There's also the danger or the panic zone, which is where you really go out on a limp. Uh, and like I used to say, or say sometimes, there's a really, really fine line between being brave and being stupid. And sometimes you will cross that line and be in the danger zone. But you have to go into the learning zone to be able to grow. And if you're not feeling a little bit uncomfortable, you're not in your learning zone. The issue about staying in your comfort zone is it, if you stay there, it, it becomes smaller. If you have a phobia and you don't challenge it once in a while, it will become bigger and bigger and bigger. And that happens with everything. So if you stay in your comfort zone, if you never ever feel like you're out on a limp, maybe you should start pushing your boundaries. And when you feel like you're an imposter, you are pushing your boundaries. And there's also people say, just fake it until you make it. Um, try some things out. You can actually also show vulnerability. I know this is not very nice, but you can say, hey, this is my first time speaking, I'm scared shitless. Well, it's not my first time speaking, but um, you could do that if it was your first time. And then try it out. And push your boundaries. And improve where you have passion. So instead of looking at, I'm not really good at this, I'm not really good at that, Look at where, where are you really good? Where's your passion? Where are the things that you really want to do? Where are the things that are not hard to do, the easy things? Because the reason they're easy is because you like them. One of the reasons they're easy is because you like them and your brain likes them. So if you look back at school, for instance, there were some subjects that you liked and there were some subjects that you hated. I would guess that would be for most people. Usually with the subjects that you like, it's also because you find them easy, because your brain likes them. Uh, our brain uh, really likes to save energy, which means that it tries to do the things that saves energy. These are the things we are good at. So where you have your passion, where you really like to be, is probably where you're good at. And try and make this better. And grow your network. Because one of the things we know when we become experts is that we know that we don't know. But what we also know is that somebody else knows. So if you know someone who knows something that you don't know, oh, I'm gonna get, then go ask that person. So if you're working at a client, instead of saying, hey, I know everything, saying, who, this area is not really my expertise, but I know someone who knows. So for instance, I, I go out and I work with people, and I tell them, agile does not work if you do not have some of the technical aspects. If you do not do automatic testing, if you do not do at least continuous, um, not necessarily deployment, but continuous builds, Agile is not going to work for you. You can have all the nice processes in the world, but if you do not have the technical expertise, it's not going to help you. You cannot test in Scrum. You cannot do regression testing every time if you have to do it manually. So I can tell people about these things, but I cannot help them. I cannot sit down with them and show them what it's like to do TDD. I can still do pair programming, uh, but I cannot do TDD, for instance. But what I can do is say, hey, I know some people who knows about this. I can call them in. So by growing your network, it becomes OK that you don't know everything. It becomes OK that you are not the expert in every area, because you know someone who knows. What is also important about this is that these people is going to help you. These people are going to go in, and they're actually going to tell you that you are OK. That's at least my experience, is that the more people you know, the more feedback you get. Which means that when you feel like you're a fraud, like I did a month ago when I realized, shit, what did I say yes to? Uh, I wrote on Twitter, okay, I know I'm going to talk about this process, but I actually have it right now. I know that I have it, but it doesn't help. I feel like I'm really stupid that I'm going to give this talk. And people come back to me and saying, yes, I tried this, and... Um, and um, Nobody is going to hire you for a talk if you're not a good speaker, uh, at least not two times. Um, so you get this feedback from people. And one of them will even say, hey, maybe I should help you. I did a lot of talks. So by having your network, 
you can, first of all, ask other people for help with the things that you don't know, but you can also get better. So by having the imposter syndrome, it helps us to see that we don't know everything. Um, and if we use these one, two, three, four, five, six steps, uh, it's gonna help us in to become better developers, analysts, speakers, managers, whatever we are. Um, so by feeling insecure and like a fraud, we can actually turn this to our advantage. So basically, um, what it's all about is that since 70% of people suffer from this, you can just take a look around. This is seven out of 10, which means that unless um, Dutch people are really, really confident, there should be a shitload of people in here who tried the imposter syndrome at some point. It may be you, it may be the person next to you, but it's something that happens to a lot of people. And yet we don't talk about this. We don't ask for help. We don't show our openness. I believe very much in openness. I believe that being brave, part of this, is about being vulnerable. It's about saying, I feel shitty today, or I feel good today for that matter. We tend to talk about professionalism as something where, that we just put on when we go out the door. Yes, I'm gonna be professional now. I'm gonna put on my penguin suit and then I'm gonna go to work and I'm gonna be a good consultant. And what do you do then? You spend so much energy pretending to be somebody else. We actually do pretend to be somebody else if we put on that kind of professionalism. So by being vulnerable and by being open, we at least will not feel like a fraud in that way. We can be whole people. And that also means we can then say to people next to us, hey, I'm not feeling well today. I did this talk and I'm not sure it went well. What do you think? Um, would you look at my code with me, for instance? Or um, you could go to your manager and say, I actually need you to acknowledge me. I need you to tell me when I'm doing good. If you need this, tell your manager. We don't do this. And often a lot of managers, I've had managers who said, well, if I don't tell you anything, you're doing okay. That's not helpful for me. I logically know that if I'm not told anything, I'm doing good. That doesn't help me. Research shows that for every negative thing that somebody says to you, you need five positive things to just become up to a neutral. Um, and I think this is also one of the reasons we suffer from this, because we are evaluated all the time. We are told negative things all the time. We are told to be perfect. And this is my, one of my, well, like I said, I'm not called, this is one of the reasons I think we, are, we become this. We try to be so perfect because that is what we are thought we are supposed to be. In school, everything we are taught, we are supposed to be good. And this is the way we get recognition. But we should get recognition for just being us, for just being fun, for just being kind, for just being open, for being a good buddy. Of course, we should also get recognition if we do something good with our brains or with our hands or whatever. But remember to tell people these things. And more importantly, remember to tell yourself. I think this is really, really important. Remember that what you do matters. Brené Brown, who is a really, really amazing American scientist, says, we are all perfect with all our imperfections. I love this. We are all unique. We are all imperfect, and that is what makes us perfect. Otherwise, we would just be clone warriors. And we all know it's the bad side. Um, so, wrap up. Many people suffer from this. I do. A lot, I've been working with it. I see a lot of people suffer from this and not asking for help. If you suffer from this, go in and read a little bit about it and start acknowledging yourself and asking for help. So, I love connecting. So, in my uh, slides, I have my LinkedIn, my native Wired uh, blog, which I'm supposed to write on. Um, I do also sometimes uh, my email, uh, I'm also on Sing because I work a lot in Germany. Um, and remember to rate the session. See, I'm one of the speakers, not like Michael who forgot to put the slides in. Um, remember to rate the session. <laughs> um, 
And in the slides that I will that will be online, there will also be links to, well, the Husky Cat, very important, but also to blog posts. And actually, they're done in Kruger from this cool page about how to be a saxophonist. But they had the most interesting uh, drawing of the Dunning-Kruger effect. So, <laughs> we have what ten minutes for question? Yes. Hello. The first question we have is, how did you actually know? this feelings, what you were experiencing, was experiencing, was called the imposter syndrome. How did you discover this? So how did I discover that what I feel is the imposter syndrome? Somebody told me. Um, ever since I was really small, I had this feeling of being a fraud. Uh, so up until I was about 15, I didn't really have any friends. I was really, really good in school. And everywhere, so the only way I would get praise was to be good in school. And I kept thinking, at some point, somebody's going to find out I'm not really good at this. At some point, people are going to find out I'm a fraud. Same happened when I went to university. Uh, and I thought, this was just me. This was just because I wasn't good enough. And then at some point, um, a friend of mine told me about the imposter syndrome. Uh, so I was being coached by, coached by her. And she says, I think you suffer from the imposter syndrome. And I looked it up and kind of like, holy shit. Maybe I do. Um, but it actually took me at least five years to admit that this was it. Because if I admit that I suffer from the imposter syndrome, I also admit that I'm intelligent, which means that I'm not a fraud, which means that what my brain makes me feel is wrong. It's like, shit. Uh, so it took me a long time to actually say, yes, I suffer from the imposter syndrome. I am really smart, and I doubt myself. Um, but I only found out because somebody told me, and that is one of the reasons I want to give this talk. Thank you. Then the next question is, say you ex suspect somebody is suffering from this. Do you have a way of starting the conversation over this? So if I expect somebody who suffers from an imposter syndrome, do I have a way of starting it, a uh, conversation? Yes. I go and say, you want to have some coffee? Um, one of my magical powers is I'm a really, really good listener. For, uh, so I, when I listen, I don't judge people. And more importantly, I don't listen with the intent to answer. Often when we listen to people, we listen with the intent to answer. I actually listen to people with the intent to hear what they're saying. It makes a big difference, uh, and a lot of people don't realize this. So if I expect someone to suffer from this, I would then go over and have coffee with them. I would have them talk a little bit, and then I would ask them if they knew about this. Uh, if I see some of the symptoms. And I, so I am not a coach coach, uh, whatever that is. I'm an agile coach, but I do have one-on-ones uh, with a lot of people, and I see so many people suffering from this. Developers, managers, testers, all levels in all organizations. Um, and one thing that I also am, so I'm brave, as I said, so I tell them. I say, hey, it seems like you're suffering from this. Just as if somebody, if I see somebody who I think is stressed, I go over and say it to them. I tell people what I see in a nice way, but I tell it to them. And I think this is really important. So if you see someone doing this, go over to them saying, hey, you want to have coffee? And then you talk to them. Thank you. And the next one is, how do you know the difference between the imposter syndrome and just being an imposter? <laughs> how do you know the difference between being an imposter and having the imposter syndrome? Well. People who think they have the imposter syndrome are usually not imposters, except if you do impostering for a living. Um, like the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio, Catch Me If You Can, he was an imposter, and if he was feeling bad at it, he would be an imposter suffering from the imposter syndrome. Um, but most people who think they are imposters are not. So from the outside, you cannot always see this. Uh, I do believe, uh, from the imposters that I met, which is a handful, um, that imposters are actually really, really good at what they do. Otherwise, we would catch them earlier. If they're really, really good at what they do, there's a 70% chance that they suffer from the imposter syndrome. 
Uh, but I don't think from the outside you can always tell this. Uh, from the inside you definitely can, because if you feel like an imposter, you're probably not. Then there's a follow-up question actually for this, and how do you know if you're suffering from the imposter syndrome or just a functioning psychopath, uh, sociopath? If I'm what? A functioning sociopath, high-functioning sociopath. Ah. So, uh, how do you know the difference between if you are an impost, uh, suffering from the imposter syndrome or you are a high-functioning sociopath? Um, that's a really good question. I don't believe high-functioning sociopaths believe they're imposters. I believe they are very aware of what they do. I've only met one, maybe two, and they are very, very aware of what they do. They are very aware of what they're good at, and they do it whatever it takes. Um, so uh, from the outside, what you will see with these high-functioning sociopaths is they have a lot of confidence. Uh, some people who suffer from the imposter syndrome seem to have a lot of confidence. People have been telling me that it's actually really, really hard to tell that I have it, uh, because I seem really confident. Um, so sometimes you need to get close to people, you need to listen to them, you need to see the small signs. Um, it, often I find that if people are too cocky, they probably suffer from the imposter syndrome. They are probably feeling inferior and they need to make themselves wide and strong and look all... So I work in IT, so it's usually men. And usually, guys who go brr, brr, and I'm better at coding than you do, and you can never ever delete code in refactoring. One guy told me this until I told him, well, I just talked to um, Martin Fowler here last week, and he told me you could. That helped a little bit. Um, one of the advantages of being a speaker is you can actually go talk to the people. But what I found out was that he was actually feeling really, really inferior, and having a woman <gasps> come in and actually knowing more about the fracturing that he did, even though I hadn't coded for 10 years, was a big problem for him. Um, so he was being cocky because he was feeling inferior. Uh, so if they are too cocky, they usually suffer, I believe they're suffering from the imposter syndrome, or they're actually at least having a lot of confidence problems. Um, sociopaths are usually not cocky, they're just really, really confident. Um, there's a fine distinction there. Okay, and then what is your favorite story of somebody overcoming the imposter syndrome? My favorite story of somebody overcoming the imposter syndrome? Me? <laughs> Except that one. Uh, I'm on stage. In 2006, when I was at IBM, uh, my manager told me, you have a goal this year. Your major goal this year is to speak up when your whole team is there. That was my goal in 2006. This is 10 years ago. So I started by going out and speaking into colleges, telling young girls that, yes, you can be a woman in IT. That was okay, I was just speaking to a few people. Today I'm at the point where if you tell me, okay, can you speak tomorrow in front of 3,000 people? I say, sure, what do you want me to talk about? Um, part of why I feel confident is because I found out that I'm not alone. I found out there's something called the imposter syndrome. I also found out that I'm not the only one in the world who wants to make it better. That being a hippie is actually okay. I used to think that that was something stupid, but being a hippie is basically, hey, we want to have a nice world. I want people to treat each other nicely. Uh, so actually getting my network helped me overcome my imposter syndrome, and I haven't overcome it. I have it once in a while, every time something new happens. The first time I had to give a guest lecture at university, I was terrified, and it's so stupid. I mean, it was in front of first-year computer science students. They knew nothing about Agile. They basically knew nothing except what they learned in school. But I was terrified. The first time I did a keynote, I was terrified. The first time I had to do a talk with a microphone, I was terrified. I'm kind of like, okay, only really good speakers use microphones because they have these big rooms. The first time I was filmed, I was terrified. So I do still suffer from it, but by working with it, by talking to people, by being vulnerable and saying, hey, shit, I feel really, really not confident right now. Uh, I have overcome most of it. Um, so my favorite story is actually me. That's all the time we have. Okay. I'd just like to remind you again to write the session, and thank you very much. Thank you.